Jason immediately back in the chat. Are we there yet? <laughs> Are we there yet? <laughs> Okay, let me put out an updated tweet with the link in case people uh, don't have it. Okay. There, there we go, that's better. And it's like, oh, stream, stream is, stream health is excellent. You're not overburdening us with your, with your internet connection, giving us all the bits possible. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> not choppy out of ten. Not choppy out of ten. But that, Fantastic. That's... Yep, that's that's all we can hope for, and that, that that is all we can hope for, right? And yeah, and good thing we got this out of the way because these are the exact settings we're going to be using for the next couple nights because uh, the other two shows are already confirmed to have three people. So, <laughs> okay, excellent. Whoa, whoa! I didn't break this. YouTube <laughs> did. Someone purged the heathen. Oh uh, no, it wasn't me who said that. It was it, I know. It, it was it wasn't it wasn't Toki who said that. It was I know. <laughs> I see in the chat. Yeah. No, I'm just saying out of principle. Oh just just yeah, that, I, I wish I could kick him, but do the, the <laughs> format as website. Actually now I know what I can do. Oh yeah, no. that, that's your area of expertise. Yeah, I signed Toki out for 300 seconds. That's <laughs> I didn't mean for 300 seconds, good lord. Hey, that's that's only five minutes. He, it's not like he can't watch. That's like... <laughs> I didn't delete the message, though. Uh, <laughs> you did? It. YouTube decided to delete the message. <laughs> Oh my god! Yes, we're certainly alive. Oh yeah. man. Well. <laughs> uh, Toki is very angry in our Discord server. Yeah. Also, we have a Discord server. Yes, we, we, we do. do have a Discord server. Uh, sorry for the tremendous delay in getting this out. Uh, due to, uh, do I say circumstances outside of our control? Because it kind of was. That last bit with YouTube was, where YouTube's like, hey, y'all, your, your bit rate's too good. Uh, you could change it by stopping and restarting the stream. I'm like, okay, I stopped it. Time to restart it. Well, um, well, what had happened was you ended the stream, but you didn't schedule a new one. You can't just start again. That's not how it works. You <laughs> fill out the paperwork to start a stream before you allow you to do this. And I'm like, Twitch doesn't do this. We're not Twitch. And I'm like, what? <laughs> we were expecting too much of YouTube. Like everyone else who starts a career on here. Yep. We, we, just, we, we, we always expect too much. We're too optimistic about these things. Have you even talked to me, Vic? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Look, e even you, Cam, are optimistic sometimes. It's been 84 years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, as Toki is shouting at you, King, in our Discord server, hoping you step on a Lego. <laughs> oh, well. oh my yeah. god. For those who want a uh, for those of you in the chat who aren't in our Discord server already and you want an invite, message King. I'm yeah. gonna throw out the disclaimer I did earlier and avoid the meme chat. Yeah, you, you need to ease yourself <laughs> in. That's that's the deep end. You don't you don't go into the Discord server and then go into meme quarantine. That's like saying, hey, let, let me see what this whole uh, driving thing is. Should I get a license? Now nah, I'm going to start with Formula One. <laughs> also, uh, yes, Zoe, I am sure that Cam can be optimistic. 
sometime. <laughs> oh man. Okay, so I, th I think it's time to should we t should we talk some Formula E? Yes. So I'll, I'll we're just a bit of dead air. Then I do an intro because that that's where the cut's gonna be. Where we just <laughs> edit everything before this out. No one needs yeah. to know how we dunk on Toki. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh boy, a whole ass hour after we were supposed to start. Oh man. Yeah. Right. Okay. Whew. So, we're back for night two of Templehof Nights, and uh, b based on night one with Hazel, we, we sort of foreseen this happening, but not to this degree, where, uh, Personally, I thought it was going to be one of the Chichita cars that possibly was going to win the, win the championship. That was either going to be DaCosta or Vern. But everyone, you know, people had a third chance, but they just consistently score points and keep up with DaCosta. Uh, so that didn't happen. Uh, joining no. me tonight, it's we got we got Cam Buckley and uh, Vikesh back from the, the, the secret, super secret test stream. Um... <laughs> So first two races, guys. What, what do y'all think? Uh, well, for those of you who are looking for a championship battle, look somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, it is. It Sorry. is a very, very close fight for second in the championship. I was gonna yeah. say, think of it. Approach it like Formula One. As long <laughs> as you don't care about who wins, it's a very close battle. Okay, yep. and to just give a breakdown to uh, people who might have not watched the first two races, uh, even though they're on YouTube. Well, I don't know how quick the replays have gone up, but they it, it was it was a whole day ago, uh, and uh, and, that's how yeah. and pretty much uh, DaCosta Grand Slammed race one. Uh, he. Oh, he didn't just. If there's a if there's a scale above Grand Slam, he actually got. He was fastest in the group qualifying. Yes. Fastest in qualifying. Yep. Fastest in the race. Led every lap and won the race. Yes. There, there are twenty five yeah. points yeah. for a win, and there are five bonus points each for group stage pole, uh, actual pole, and fastest lap. He got all of those. Race two. Uh, he couldn't get a uh, fastest lap, but, or group stage pole, but he got pole and won the race. So, uh, we're in a situation where DaCosta leads the championship by 68 points and second in the championship now, Audi's Lucas Degrassi has 57 points, uh, yeah. just to catch Antonio Felix DaCosta, <laughs> uh, joint second. Uh, Audi's Lucas DaCosta, and uh, I mean, Lucas <laughs> Audi, Lucas Degrassi. Audi's Lucas DeGrassi, and uh, Mercedes Stoffel Van Dorn, both sitting up at 57 points, would need to score more than the amount of points they already have to catch Antonio. Yeah, they'd have to over double their points. Yeah, you know, it's, it's it's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. And However, as King, as you alluded to earlier, the battle for second, five drivers cover by five points. Yes. Yeah, running down the table after DaCosta. Degrassi, 57. Van Dorn, 57. Jaguars Mitch Evans, 56. Uh, Sam Bird, 52. Sebastian Buemi, 52. Alexander Sims, 48. Uh, that is very tight fight for second, and that's pretty much how the races played out in in the themselves. Where Takasa would just pull away from everyone else for the most part, as despite uh, race one, it seemed to be uh, yeah. Race one, we had a uh, we we had a good fight between the two Tachitas where they fucked off from the field together. Yeah, until uh, my boy. Andre Lauder <laughs> made it a fight for a second. Yep. DaCosta was under threat. 
and kind of like the most controversial part of uh, the first race, well, both races so far, is is when DaCosta was actually under threat from his teammate, Sean Eric Fern. And uh, things got a bit dicey. <laughs> most, most notably, uh, when DaCosta went to go activate attack mode, taking the long way around the corner, and it seemed like, hey, maybe this is Vern's chance to, to get some time out front. Uh, Vern thought it was his time for some time out front. Uh, the team thought it was going to be his time for some time out front. But Antonio was like, nah, fam. <laughs> <laughs> this is my team. I run this bitch now. <laughs> and, um, s- safe to say, after the race, Jeff was undurring. During, yeah, during the race, he was shredding into his team over the radio and ended up kind of angry driving to the point where he blew his tires off. Yeah, and yeah. he destroyed his tires, which is insane because you only get, like, one set for the entire day in Formula E. Yeah. Uh, but pretty much, uh, Vern was under the understanding that they wouldn't race each other, that they would they would drive their own races and then just freely let each other by when they had to, with most notably saying that DaCosta needed to respect the beeps. The beeps to uh, start regen, you know, let off, regenerate some battery power, and seemingly DaCosta didn't, but then in question, where DaCosta was flying at battery, then a race one, uh, jean Eric Verne was not... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but he's doing it too. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> uh, and you just get the situation where, pretty much, Vern shot himself trying to race to Costa, and it it cost him a chance of not only at only second, but just points in general. And that was the case for everyone in the top well, in the top five spots who wasn't Antonio Felix Acosta, where he had Mitch Evans, who was going into into Berlin second in the championship. He has yet to score points so far. Two races, two ducks from Mitch Evans. Yep. And that drops him down to fourth in the championship. Yeah. All I'm going to say is, as, uh, as the local Porsche shell, yeah. Karma. <laughs> Karma. Talking about Porsche, they've... They didn't start their... Well, Andre did start the year off of the podium, but in between the first race and Berlin, it was not a great year for Porsche, but it seems like the time off helped, and Andre's back on the podium. Yeah, uh, the Porsche... The Porsche's been very fast at every race. It's just... Either they haven't gotten the race right strategically, or they've been sent to the Shadow Realm once by one uh, Mr. Mitch Evans. I have another name for him that I will refrain from using here. (laughs) Um, But when Andre can put a race together, he's been very quick this year. And he did. He was passing cars with abandon late in race one. Yeah. And And, I was able to take a spicy P2. It's it's pretty much like the the people who are having strong showings in this race are people who didn't have strong showings early on in the year, which causes the problem where it's everyone who didn't have points are now scoring points. Everyone who did have points aren't scoring points. And so, DeCoss is just scoring regardless. Yeah, so DeCoss yeah. is just is not only driving away on track, but on the points table, he's, you know, soaring away from everyone else. Where people kind of forgot that back in Marrakesh, the last race we did before Berlin, DaCosta won that too, and got pole. So, uh, yeah, and got pole. So, he he was on a war path to begin with. And there's only been two races so far this year he wasn't in the top two. So... Like, on paper, this is the most dominant season in Formula E's brief history. 
It yeah. would because even in Mexico City before that Marrakesh race and before the pause, De Costa finished second behind Mitch Evans that day, so he still picked up eighteen points. Yeah. Yeah. And it's He has just been the epitome of consistency in season two. Yeah, and it's oh, it basically to to break down the uh, the only championship permutation that matters, uh, just being mathematically eligible to win the championship. <laughs> uh, the cut line after the first two races was uh, pretty pretty lenient so far. So the cut line is 120 points. You need to be within 120 points to uh, to win the championship after these first two races, meaning that uh, everyone down to, well, the, the only current drivers in the field that are eliminated from contention are as follows. Uh, Audi's Rene Rast, who again, he just started his year, so it, it didn't really matter that much. Uh, <laughs> Brendan Hartley, he he left, so that doesn't matter that much. And yeah. Felipe Massa, the the only full time driver who got dropped out of contention. Uh, I believe uh, I believe Gianni is out as well. Uh yes, everyone on zero yeah. points is also out. So uh, I just want to call him out specifically, <laughs> for not just for having zero points. <laughs> So yeah, the the zero points be laid out. Uh, at, also at Jag, Alex Lynn, uh, as Cam alluded to, Porsche's Neil Yanni, Oliver Turvey's out, uh, Nico Muller is out, uh, Ma Kung Ha also on zero points who couldn't be here in Berlin also out, and Sergi Sergio Sete Camera out, meaning that uh, yeah we're we're already dropping a large number of drivers. And over the next two races, the next double header, it's it's gonna be cold down even further because next race the cut line is ninety points, and the race after that the cut line is sixty points. So, uh, Decosta would have to have a cataclysmic series of bottles to even even get anyone else in striking range. Yeah, he would essentially have to be out of the race before qualifying started for the next four races. Yeah. to give anyone a hope of winning this championship. And that would involve the guys in second either winning or just being on the podium. Yeah, because yeah. And... Uh, right now, nobody's within that second cut line of 60 points. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, boy. We, we lost Vic. Okay. Okay, so, yeah... But yeah, pretty much no one's within that cut line of 60 points as it stands right now. Everyone in the field, well, right now it's most importantly Degrassi and Van Dorn need to outscore DaCosta by at least 8 points to be in contention for the championship going into the last two days. Which... Yeah, and this is a championship where the championship has gone down to the final race. What every year? Yes, every year. It, every, yeah, it's that's it's not happening this year. So far. And especially with the the pace advantage that just to cheat uh, to cheetah in general, DS to cheetah have been untouchable. Yeah, okay. in yeah. Berlin I mean, so we, far. We said it while we were watching the race yesterday. The only comparison to them is Mercedes and Formula One. Yeah, yeah, it was it was Mercedes esque, and like we're also kind of thinking a bit ahead to the future. We'll probably talk more about it in the season finale. Well, in in the season review episode of Temple Off Nights, is uh, the fact that the Evo cars, the the up the slight updated, more powerful cars, the that were supposed to debut next year got pushed back one year so maybe in terms of development of these powertrains to maybe get something to get a jump onto cheetah next year that's gone uh we we got what we got Are the powertrains locked the powertrains they're, they're, they're not locked but uh the new regs the 
it's not a new regulation. It's like the maximum power output allowed in a race was mm. going to be raised, meaning that there was more room to play with to try to get more efficiency. Or if you had a really uh, efficient uh, motor already, you could just abuse that efficiency to get more power overall. Mm. Uh, now you're thinking you, 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 what you got, the, like the rule set, you guys, the rule set you got, you got to develop within that. And right now doesn't seem like anyone's close to Tachita. Uh, no, no, I've seen flashes from everyone, but as soon as Tachita worked out their early season kinks, they've really been, they were what we thought they were before the season started. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, kind of it shows out on track where a lot of people run into issues in terms of uh, battery usage where again a lot of people are playing it just right and crossing the finish line on zero that's the most optimum race strategy finish with no energy left in the tank Uh, but some people have been struggling either overextending themselves or not not pushing hard enough to get to that point uh, where say BMW were really efficient running at the back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, we had a bunch of teams, including Tachita. They are playing it just right. And then um, I believe Fli- F- uh, Felipe Massa ran himself out of energy very early in race two. Like, I, I don't first, even know how that's possible. Too heavy a right foot. Because uh, he was uh, he was out of energy early on on the last lap, yeah. like, it wasn't even borderline. But yeah. and um, the, uh, the the trick the trick in FE as King said is to cross with zero percent energy, and then coast across the line so you don't get the time penalty involved with exceeding the one hundred percent allowable uh, energy. Yeah, and you and to talk about the the BMWs coasting in the back heading into Berlin the BMWs Sims Sims and Gunther were third and fourth in the drivers championship due to their their early outings with Gunther getting disqualified in race one uh, and just well, no, but that's the thing BMW would have one car win or be on the podium and then one car have a hellacious weekend now they're both having those <laughs> yeah the good uh, karma for one car is now reduced to no good karma. So their third and fourth in the championship is now seventh and and ninth. Uh, again, they like it was Sims, uh, Gunther, and Evans that were on paper, based on just on points alone, you'd assume would be the biggest threats to Antonio Felix Acosta, and just implosion, oh. <laughs> just implosion. No, nope, they were. <laughs> Between uh, time penalty, time penalties received for um, changing out parts to just not having pace, BMW were straight up back markers in both races, really. Yeah, and outside of, well, yeah, outside of the people we mentioned so far, the the next biggest threat to the front were the Mercedes, which which is surprising as a team. Technic, like in reality, it's their second year. On paper, it's their first year. Uh, first with Mercedes power. Yeah, first with Mercedes yeah. power. Uh, it's, it's they they've shown it's similar to Porsche. They yeah. they show flashes and they are very fast in isolation, but team errors or issues out on track or in their case for liability problems have kind of stymied any chance at a, uh, a real championship run. Yeah. I mean, they still have a chance. They have Stoffel Van Dorn third in the championship, which says a lot about how far <laughs> DaCosta is running away. <laughs> yeah. Um, Van Dorn had uh, not great in qualifying, but had phenomenal race pace. Yeah. Phenomenal race pace. Uh, pulling sick moves. Oh, yeah, uh, in race two, he had to move around the outside. I believe it was um, it was one of the Virgins and one of the Audis, yeah. I believe. And I just... want to say it was Robin Fryens and Lucas Degrassi. Yes. And just, oh, my goodness, ripped their souls out. 
yeah, just it through the braking zone of that hairpin about halfway around the lap, just pulled to the outside. It was just so much later on the brakes that you wouldn't have expected him to make the corner and drove clean around the outside of both drivers. Yeah. For to go up from seventh to fifth place, I believe it was. It's almost like he uh, shouldn't have been booted out of F1. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know how it goes. No, it wasn't. It was um, it was Sam Bird and Oliver Rowland. Ah. It was one of the uh, Nissans. Yeah. Ah. And kind of to illustrate, uh, like, just the chaos in general, the fact that, that BMW are second in the drivers, I mean, second in the team's <laughs> championship, which, uh, like, those numbers are a bit iffy because of just the basis of being easier for, for just a team in general to score one point, but uh, the... The margin is roughly the same in the team championship, with Tachita sitting on, on 157 and BMW sitting on 92. Uh, Again, they'd have to have something cataclysmic happen in order to lose the team's championship, especially with, uh, you know, Vern isn't always going to have the off days that he did this weekend. Oh, yeah, like, even if, weekend. like... If, if Vern just didn't show up to the last four races, DaCosta could win the team championship by himself. Yeah, that's how far ahead they are. It, it says a lot about just how good Antonio Felix DaCosta has been this season when 125 of the cheaters, 157 points have come from him. Yep. Yeah, he scored more points in these two races than Vern did all year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yes. They're defending champion, no less. Yeah. And Since like we thought Jean Ecran scored a grand total of one solitary point. And yeah, oh. and it's not an exaggeration to say that DaCosta would win the team championship by himself. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yo, Mark, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> How's that arm feeling? I hope you get better soon. Broke uh, a titanium plate opening a goddamn window. <laughs> what a way to lose a championship. Uh, that, that, that one's going to be a story for his grandkids someday. <laughs> Ooh, but, yeah, it's, it's... It's weird to say, but, like... Yeah, we're, we're just watching who's going to finish second in the championship. Uh, it's... There... The, the fights for a second have been interesting, but, you know, you, you wish it was for something more. Yeah. And God, I'm how sure many other sure racing series can we say too. that? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the drivers wish they were fighting over more than second as well. Yeah, but uh, that's what inconsistency will net you. Yeah. Yep. Now, kind of the the other big talking point that uh, has it hasn't really overshadowed Antonio's uh, races because it's been that massive, but uh, we didn't we didn't start off these races in Berlin in the the best of spirits because uh, after after you know this whole hiatus and everything that's happened in the world in from. Uh, COVID-19, to the protests over the death of George Floyd, uh, F Formula E decided to start an initiative in the same vein as Formula One's Races as One initiative, uh, which they've titled uh, Positively Charged, hashtag Positively Charged, and... Yeah, that, um, in hindsight, probably not the best name considering the current world climate. No. But... You can see where they were trying to go with it. And yeah. So, uh, before before the the event started at at the end of Tuesday's runnings, there the shakedown day, they had a a quote moment of reflection to uh, reflect on not only uh, all of these events but. Also, the death of a track worker who 
who lost his life last week constructing the track. And they put out a statement about this initiative, which I'll just read out right now because it's not long at all. Uh, quote, We're back, and we want to come back better. Not just united in our passion to deliver edge-of-seat edge of racing, but in our commitment to, to deliver a better future through racing. Cleaner air in our cities by accelerating development and adoption of electric vehicles. Safer, more inclusive environments for at-risk children through our partnership with UNICEF in the fight against coronavirus. Greater opportunity for underrepresented groups through the Positive Futures program we will launch in Season 7. United against discrimination in any form by nurturing a culture of inclusivity that celebrates diversity in all its forms. We know this is a race with no finish line, but that doesn't mean we can't go faster. So we'll share our progress and welcome your feedback as we move forward in our journey together. And on the eve of our return to racing, we thank our people, teams, partners, and fans for their unwavering passion and support as we work together to grow electric racing and light up the world with its transformative power. Uh, I, I, I like the, the optimism, but it's, it's, there are very few specifics. It's very vague. Bes besides, like, one or two points, there's, like, pretty much nearly no actual tangible information. There's, you, you said it, uh, you, you said it before we went live. It says a lot without actually saying anything. Yeah, like, is it, is it harsh to say that that statement could very well have been something President Snow said in the Hunger Games? <laughs> oh, not wrong uh yeah dre says it in the chat it's a lot of advertising fluff overall yeah uh, like it's it's a, a lot of fluff and they put out you know uh a slickly edited and produced video statement in a very similar vein to what formula one did over the weekend uh, it's, it's, it's not surprising, but it's disappointing. Uh, yeah. oh, that can be the, uh, that can be the episode title for the whole year. <laughs> it's not, I don't know. Th this whole global pandemic thing was a bit shocking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that one was. But yeah, so further down on that same page on the Formula Room website where they wrote that statement, there's a little bit about the work they're doing with UNICEF. And I, I quote here, it says, The ABB FIA Formula E Championship and UNICEF join forces to focus on keeping children around the world healthy and ensuring they aren't missing out on vital education in the face of current environment. To build awareness to the cause, we ran the ABB Formula E Race at Home Challenge, an eight-week esports sim racing competition featuring all 24 drivers, with the aim to raise funds towards changing the formula for children affected by coronavirus. And then there's a link if you want to donate. But there's nothing further there which actually specifies anything that they're doing or that the Formula E and UNICEF between them have planned as a course of action on how they're going to do that. Yeah, it's very vague, and it's it's nothing new, because UNICEF was their partner with the Race at Home Challenge. This wasn't specifically for this initiative. Yeah, it's promoting something that already existed. Yeah. And, like, the the only new points in in their statements is the Positive Futures program, which... They didn't even actually launch. They announced that they're gonna launch it at the start of next season in January, which, like, it it, it doesn't say, like, it doesn't list any specifics about 
the specifics about what this program is going to be. It just says that uh, we're going to create greater opportunity for underrepresented groups literally next year. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, it's like you've got six months now. Th that's a long time that you could take some action in. Yeah, and like it, it clearly, obviously, a lot of people were pushing formally to do something or say something, and they certainly said something, and they said that they're going to do something next year, and it, I think, for a lot of people, including myself, where we're we're used to hearing these words about initiatives and things like this, and. It's always announcements and never actual action where if you know something's not, you know, ready to be launched now, don't don't say anything about it. Don't ha launch this massive campaign with nothing to show for it. Like, it's literally a massive display to say, come back next year, that's when we're going to do things. Well, and it sucks all of the momentum out of any action they're trying to take. Yeah. You know, six months of, hey, come back in six months. By that point, a lot of people have already forgotten that you bothered. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, before we before we went live, we were looking at, because Formula we also put out um, a page on, like, a team-by-team -team basis, what each, what each constructor of contributing to the positive positive charge movement and just the the one that we picked out in particular was Mahindra who said that following for every Twitch viewer of the final race at home challenge event they would plant a tree and so that final live stream got close to a hundred thousand viewers and this was back in June and there's been nothing since on what Mahindra have done to actually make good on their pledge. Yeah, like, even if it was something like, hey, uh, you know, just a simple announcement saying, hey, this is the confirmed number of people who watch that stream. We're going to, you know, plant X amount of trees with this with this organization doing the work on the ground, and then that would be enough. That'd be enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but again, like, that's, you know, something that predates this initiative. People knew this existed. It's not specifically for this. Uh, it's... It's weird, and also, like, it's, you know looking back at the statement, it's not as very, it's, this movement's extremely broad, like, it's trying to do everything for all people and not piss off anyone, where, uh, so, it should be noted that in the statement, they, they don't mention climate change by name, they heavily imply it, but they don't mention it by name, uh, they don't mention racism by name, or, they just, they just use the vague term, uh, discrimination in any form, where they could have been like, hey, like, racism, homophobia, like, just mention it by name, and, like, it's... Hashtag, uh, hashtag all discrimination matters. <laughs> all discrimination uh -huh. matters. Where... That, that's how this felt. That, that is, yeah. Where people can just paint their own picture about what they want Formula E to be pushing for, and they probably wouldn't be wrong, because there's nothing to say that they're wrong about it. And it's... It's frustrating, because you come at this point, and it... You come at... You come at the situation, you know, saying that Formula E says they want to be better. Uh, it's it's hard to know what you're trying to be better from when no one knows what that from you know what? was. You, the, you know what that feels like? That feels like that really long-winded corporate speak statement when the Mission Winnow initiative <laughs> came out. <laughs> We're pushing ourselves to try and be better. What does that entail? What are you trying to be better than? Yeah. And 
is not a lot of specifics. Is and as you said, it feels like they're just trying to not piss anyone off. Yeah, and it it does come off as condescending. Where Formula E knows what the brand is, they know what audience they attract. Uh, let's just use all the buzzword that that audience likes because uh, they think we're a very progressive championship. Uh, <laughs> and we won't, you know, th- this will satisfy them until, uh, well, until we feel like doing something more. And it, it it's frustrating because it, it, it typecasts people who, who watch Formula E. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make it seem that Formula E holds their fans in high regard. It, like, to go off topic for a second, it's, it reminds me of, uh, for wrestling fans out there, when, uh, former owner of Total Nonstop Action Wrestling, Dixie Carter, had to testify in front of Congress, and she openly said that people who watch professional wrestling, you know, her business, are, you know, boys who live in their, like, boys who live in their parents' basements, and, like, it, it comes off as that, where, they're obviously formally not saying this, but uh, like it really comes off as them saying publicly that our fans are not happy with us because our fans are SJWs on Twitter. It really comes off as that. Yeah, it it reminds me of the way um, reminds me of the way someone working at Slightly Mad Studios came off as very condescending and I know better than you about what you want during a Project Cars 3 discussion. Hmm. And trying to... uh, It's the worst possible way to gauge your audience. Yeah. Or it's like, I... I, This is the audience we have. Let's treat them exactly like such. (laughs) Yeah. It makes you wonder why they're so afraid to why why use the generic term of discrimination? Why not just call it what it is and just say racism? Yeah, it's and and racism is not political. It is human rights. <laughs> That's human rights. And human rights are not controversial, and they are not confusing. I mean, help, there's a whole convention written about. It's... Oh, I... It's... Like, there's... It's... It's so frustrating. Like, I mean, in terms of... It, it should be easy. It should be easy. Like... <laughs> is it, this is... It's such a fucking open goal. Yeah. And both Formula E and Formula One kicked the other way yeah like this should be as second nature as brushing your teeth twice a day Mm -hmm. but it just isn't because like i i understand why they might not have you know specific initiatives ready to go out of the box right now due to the the current global pandemic that's understandable but the the initiatives that they announce going forward very vague they they don't feel like anything substantial if you were more specific about what you're doing people would be more accepting to give you time to achieve those goals the goals you laid out are very vague and like it's it, it feels like they're trying to shoot a basketball blindfolded when no one wants them to have a blindfold on. Yeah, like yeah, what well, it would have uh... taken an extra line in that statement saying we'll be revealing further details of these initiatives over the coming weeks and months. As it stands, it just feels it feels insincere. Is I think the best way to put it. Yeah, it does. Because it feels like they're they're basking in the advertising glory of this this thing they they feel is the flavor of the week, and it's there needs to be more substance to it, and yeah. there needs to be more immediate substance to it. Because earlier this week on Twitter, when they announced, I would, 
I didn't specifically, like, Hazel didn't specifically mention Formula E, and I didn't specifically mention it, but it was a quote reply to one of her tweets, and I, I, I called it advertism, where that's what it seems to be like, where it's mm. not doing much and mainly aimed at advertising Formula E, and because it, a lot of these initiatives, pretty much say they want to be better and say that there are problems but they won't they they solely mention what they're going to do to be what they want to be better but they don't say what the problem is in their own home like how how poor is inclusion in formula e don't know uh what is what is formula e doing to uh you know Make sure that discrimination isn't a problem in Formula E. How bad is discrimination in Formula E? Don't know. Just know that they're going to try to be better. And well, The only team we have any real information on that is the same team where we that has the information out in F1. Yeah. Mercedes, where uh, they run the program for FE more or less out of the same facility in the same building um, in Bricksworth for the power unit development. And it's the numbers are pretty telling. Yeah. And it it comes from a situation where again, like there it seems to be to deflect criticism because again, they're not they're not saying anything that's gonna, you know, upset a corporate sponsor. It's very carefully worded to be vague. Uh they're they're not saying anything that could be seen as something problematic on their end, so they they can't, you know, they there's no possibility of them facing any public or media backlash online for current problems they have that they're tr- that they might fix in the future. It's it, it's very very just vague in general, and you really saw it when. <laughs> Uh, obviously we, we opened this up with their moment of reflection at the start of, before the start of the race week, before the start of the first race, they also had another moment of reflection and, uh, obviously a thing that's become, uh, very widespread across sport is that, you know, before the event, usually during or before a national anthem, uh, the participants take a knee and, uh, like, during this moment of reflection, uh, both the Mercedes drivers took a knee, and Jeff did on race one. Jeff didn't race two. Uh, it it's very confusing on on whether it's appropriate to take a knee or not during that that moment because number one, they're just not. Uh, it's not a a moment of reflection for just for just racism or discrimination, but it's also about, uh, the current global pandemic, uh, the frontline workers, uh, the climate crisis, uh, UNICEF's actions, uh, the, the death of the track worker last week. So it, it's everything condensed down into this one individual moment. And it really makes like any, person would question whether it's appropriate or kneel, to kneel or not during that time period. Yeah, they, they snowballed it all into one big one big moment. And, and it it seems like that was another reason to do this, to just avoid that imagery that we've seen across you know, world sport, where like it it seems like they don't want that in Formula E, which goes against literally everything else they've presented to us up to this point. Yeah, and it comes back to something that you guys have mentioned on a f- quite a few episodes of the show recently in that which sponsors are they affiliated with that don't want to be associated with ending racism? Well, especially when an, uh, Adam is talking about this in the chat, um, good to see you here, that NASCAR, 
which is as about as opposite to Formula E as you could possibly get in all of motorsports. Big iron block gasoline burning V8s. And traditionally a very um, a very right wing background both in the sport and watching the sport they're unified on this they all stood behind Bubba Wallace when we thought that he was the victim of a hate crime and all of their sponsors backed all of their drivers because it feels like a situation well specifically for NASCAR that uh, that that was the national perception of NASCAR, and they had to fight mm-hmm. back against it, and yep. they were they were right to do so, and I'm glad they did. Uh, now we're in a situation where all the other racing series who didn't have that very, uh, you know, that that very conservative imagery of, affiliated with them just decided hey we don't really have to do anything because we're not we're not NASCAR. <laughs> yeah and as it as the the tables turned where in the last couple of months or so now ironically nascar is the most unified of all of motorsports on this issue mm-hmm. which a year ago you would have never thought that i could tell you that and you would have laughed me out of the room and just to play devil's advocate here, if it wasn't for the Kyle Larson incident with their with NASCAR's own esports championship in the first half of the year, that was a standalone event. Yeah, it like it it wasn't associated with NASCAR at all, except that the incident involved a NASCAR driver. Yeah, yeah, but. but... It, Irrespective of that, it was in front of a few thousand people on Twitch, and boy, word got out quick. Yep. Yeah. Like, it ooh. feels like that was the kick up the backside that NASCAR needed to go, hang on, maybe we need to clean up our act here. It was a very dodge the bullet moment for NASCAR, because had that, had that standalone event take place two weeks later in a very different America. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I thought. Think about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my where, god. Where NASCAR realized we need to we need to clean ourselves up because if we don't, that that incident could have killed the the sport. Yeah, it would have dismayed. It would the public image of that, especially for someone who was as big a star in NASCAR as Kyle Larson was, would have been terrible for their brand irreparable nearly yeah because and like kind of harkening back to that like nascar was fairly slow to act at first they you know just simply suspended kyle larson at first uh well they yeah they suspended him and then they gave him the options to be reinstated and then the sponsors started to uh started to abandon him and then yeah. Chevrolet, the manufacturer of the car he drove, abandoned him. And then his team abandoned him because they realized they were going to lose their manufacturer support and their sponsorship. Yeah. Which and brings it back to the question, what sponsors are they? Do does FE think they're going to piss off? Yeah. And why aren't they asking, what about not being a racist, which shouldn't be an issue for people? What yeah. about that is so damaging to your image? Because the thing is that, you know, they're, they're in a situation where it's like, where, like, I think I always reference this in, to Formula 1, but it's fairly true in Formula E, where most of the people in higher positions are, you know, not poor, uh, probably white, so, like, they don't feel like they have to talk about anything. It's where where it's it's always framed like this, like, it's not just a motorsport thing. It's, it's a real-world thing where, where racism is always framed as a problem that ne- needs to be solved by the people who are the victims of it. Yeah. And when has any problem ever <laughs> been solved by the victims of said problem or the people no. affected by said problem? No, it takes people who aren't affected by it but who see it and 
they they're the ones who make a difference here and we more really than that, push it, it takes, forward more than that it takes the people causing that problem to recognize that they're causing a problem admit yeah. that to themselves and change their behavior <clears throat> yeah and it it's that's why this whole thing's frustrating because it doesn't seem like an like a true admission of their you know their behavior in this problem and it it feels like formally is just you know doing the bare minimum to get by and not face criticism from the people who actually care about this problem oh, they're, they're 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 biting onto the flavor of the week trying to get some advertising from it and with no substance behind it it feels like yeah. yeah and I forgot where I pointed this out but like in terms of actual like oh I lost my train of thought this like <laughs> <laughs> but so formally like it does have a certain you know idea in people's mind in what they stand for, despite them not actually standing for this, because you know, before this, before this point in time, formally e, the only thing they, you know, really pushed for is, you know, averting the climate crisis, which, you know, fair thing to stand for, but you, uh, you kind of think that, considering that is the whole idea <laughs> upon which electric cars are predicated on. Yeah, like their whole their whole mantra when the series was set up was we are the environmentally friendly sports here. Yeah. Uh though it's it it feels like it's not you know, it's not just a formal E thing, it's it's a world thing that uh being having one pol having one political stance makes it more people assume that you have other stances even though that shouldn't be the case that people assume that if if you're vocal about climate change you're also vocal about other issues that people assume are in the same camp like uh like you know uh lgbtq rights and uh anti-racism and other things that formerly he's never actually said anything about, but people just assume. People assume because it's viewed, rightly or wrongly, as the progressive motorsport. Yeah. Yeah. And when when all of those things generally are put under the blanket umbrella of discrimination, and that's the word that Formula E used in their original <laughs> state, really doesn't help that it. No, it doesn't. No. And you're sort of running into a situation where Formula One have to, like, they're trying to avoid to face a reckoning about their current stances because, like, like it's, it's hard to avoid, but, you know, we kind of forgot to mention it, but, uh, at the, we kind of failed to mention it, but, also, other big Formula E news that Alejandro Agag tested positive for COVID-19, the founder of the series. Not just him. He he did, as well as the team boss of Mahindra. Yes, as well as the All team the boss of out. Mahindra. And Alejandro Agag used to be in politics, and uh, he, he was a member of Spain's center-right party. And... Uh, some of the views that uh, Formula E has you know, kind of ignored in the past and recently adopted are views that fall out of line with Alejandro's past, which, uh, I mean, if he's changing his mind, good, good on him. But, like, I hope that wasn't a reason why formerly he hasn't talked about it in the past. No. Yeah. You uh, would hope not, but also, would we be surprised if that did turn out to be the case no no which again where it were when when i saw that statement again not surprised but disappointed uh and 
like, I hope that this is not only a wake-up call for Formula E itself, but people who uh, are fans of Formula E on that basis, that, you know, just because things appear to be a way you perceive it to be, it might not actually be the case. And that's, that's not a reason to abandon Formula E. That's a reason to criticize Formula E, publicly pressure them to try to make more... Uh, I think that's very important, is that we don't say this to bash Formula E or a form of motorsport that is also going through it. We say this because we want them to be better. Yes. Yeah. It, and that can, go, that can be the case for all parts of life. Yeah, it, it's, it, it boils down to, and again, it comes back to the whole racism isn't complicated or political. It boils down to nobody's perfect. There's areas in our lives we can all improve. It's just we're not going to see them on our own. It takes our peers and others around us to point out that we're, you're going wrong in this area. It, it takes a conscious effort from everyone on this front. Yeah. yeah, that's why when you see people criticizing drivers for not taking part, in you know a symbolic gesture it's not specifically that that driver might think that way charl but who <laughs> it it's it's a symbol like it's it's to show solidarity that you understand that this is a problem that that it's to it's to say it's to tell other people hey maybe you should look into this you know bring attention to issues yeah you can't just be you can't just be against the issue. You have to be against those who are for the issue. Yeah. Because at the, end, as... at the end of the day, being against the issue comes down and includes calling out the people causing the said issue. Exactly. It's not enough to just be not racist. You have to be definitively anti-racist. Yeah. Yeah. And... King, something you mentioned while we were watching the race yesterday. Um, Jamie Regal, who took over as CEO of Formula E from Alejandro Gag, he was part of, was it the Los Angeles Rams when they were going through a scandal? Yes. Uh, that you, that so you he was head of marketing at the LA Rams during a tumultuous time period for the National Football League. Uh, <laughs> where uh, do do elaborate? <laughs> so back, so a couple of years ago, when we were dealing with you know the same issues that we're dealing now in the United States, uh, pretty much there was you know a summer where we had multiple incidents of the uh, police you know killing unarmed black people in the United States uh, one NFL player decided to uh, take a stance uh, and kneel at the start of the national anthem well kneel during the national anthem to bring attention to this he, di he didn't tell anyone he was doing this he did it a couple times without literally anyone noticing uh, <laughs> and then uh eventually down the line uh, for unrelated reasons, well, they claim unrelated reasons, his, his team, uh, his, uh, his team uh, the San Francisco 49ers uh, dropped him from the team and uh, despite being a capable quarterback, decorated accomplished quarterback, no other team signed him. And still have yet to sign him. And still have yet to sign him. And one of those teams, uh, out of the 31 other teams in the league, one of those teams was the Los Angeles Rams, where uh, Jamie Regal was vice president of business operations. Uh, so, again, we're in a situation where we're, we're looking at people in power to do better. Especially someone with a past like this, where... Again, he's in charge of business operations. He probably had no say in personnel decisions, just just to be clear. Uh, but it's it's something that 
makes it seem like it's a systemic issue. That it's it's not just a motorsport problem. It's it's not something that's just relegated to the National Football League. That we live in a very connected world and people have positions everywhere. Sport is a business and it doesn't matter what form of sport you're in, you could take up a job in a different form of sport. And you, you can't just say it's another sports problem. No, because at the end of the day, Monday to Friday, most sports are a business the same as any other. All sports are. Yeah. At the end of the day, a lot of society is a business. Yeah. More than what people might realize. Yeah. It, it's, it's why we get so frustrated when we see people saying oh keep the politics out of sports like you can't they've been interwoven throughout history there's no getting away from that yeah, yeah and it's, the day, and most of, uh, it's, it's yeah. not a hoping that people will be better it is there are systemic problems that no matter how good a person is unless you address the problem it's prob- It's not going to change. No. It, it, it's not, and there's no getting around that. Oh, and s- sort of, it, we're going to, uh, hopefully, hopefully, because it's, it's probably too late for anything to be done during the, uh, the last, over the next week that we were still in Berlin. Mm-hmm. Hopefully... Yeah formally sticks to their words and takes action in season seven because if they don't we're gonna have to hold them accountable for it yeah and the whole the whole freedom of speech and or people are entitled to their own opinion well you're entitled to do what you want we're also equally entitled to call your ass out on it yes that yeah Free, can, freedom of speech works, works both ways. You can do what you want, but people can yeah. talk about what you do. Yeah. yeah. And and if people see a valid right to you, they're more than open to criticize you about what you're doing. Yes. Like, so even before the start of Season 7 in January, Formula E has still got four months, four and a half months even after the conclusion of these races in Berlin to show some substance behind that statement where they said, yeah, we're going to do better. We're going to make sure that we tackle all these issues. Like in that four and a half months, show us what you're going to do. Yeah. There needs to be a certain level of transparency regarding this. Yeah. You, Which... you, you can't use uh, vaguely worded terminology to, you know, try to get people on your side uh, people, it, it's to the point where people have a general idea of what needs to be changed. Give them the facts, the figures, the hard numbers to make them understand that you are, you are by every definitive measure, improving. People aren't dumb. No, and it's so easy. You know, we have all the information of the, in the world right at our fingertips 24-7, 365. If you're not holding your word, people will know, and they will know immediately. Yeah. It, you know, it's it's not like even in the early 2000s or the late 1990s, you know, if everyone's got a smartphone in their pocket these days. People will find out within seconds because mm-hmm. someone will put word on social media and that will spread like wildfire. Absolutely. Yeah, and... Formula E, despite the late start of the season, has a fairly sizable off season because un- we're we're not returning at at the end of November or December like in prior seasons. They have all the way till the, to January. Uh, any any closing statements before we head off to uh, restart racing tomorrow for another? F- fresh double header at the quote unquote traditional layout in Templehof. Ah uh, yes. Technically Templehof one. <laughs> we had Templehof two electric boogaloo first. Yep. Yeah. It, it's that Which... it's that Star Wars setup where we're doing the prequels first. <laughs> oh for God's sake. <laughs> Wait which 
King, we, we agreed on a stream title yesterday, and that, that's not the title I'm seeing here. I'm mad. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I promise I'll do better, as in I won't do anything at all and use the same <laughs> format I've always done, and hopefully there won't be enough complaints for me to actually need to take action. Oh, f- <laughs> <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> But yeah, any comments about the next upcoming races? Does does the Costa win it all or not? I, I'm less curious whether he wins it. I'm curious how much he wins it by. Yeah, I'm saying much- does does he clinch the championship before the next stream? <laughs> I don't I don't know if he does just because of the unpredictability factor. But I want him to. I want him to clinch it next race, just for the main factor. <laughs> yeah. Just for the main, I, just ninety I, I, points. Get it over it. with. Get it over I'm, with. I'm wondering if he gets the full thirty points every race for the next four. Oh my god! It's not out of the question. I. The, the biggest thing I'm curious about is who is going to be best of the rest because we have no real order behind the Tachitas. Yeah. Where anything um, can happen, hey, like, jean Eric Vern's close enough that he could still technically get second in the championship. He has to not melt down like he did in this first doubleheader because he melted the F down. He did, yeah. <coughs> and then... Um... Can, can Jaguar pick up the early season form they had again? Because Jaguar since, pick up any form. We start. Oh boy, it's not been a good time for. Oh, uh, talk about how bad it's been for Mitch Evans. James Collado's had two races from hell. Yeah, he's, Multiple, and, Col- uh, he's and, had a torrid season. And, and Collado's not going to get a chance to redeem himself because he's he's gone. He's he's going to do yeah. the WEC race. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, he's uh, he's needed in Spa for the six hours. Yeah, so James Collado finishes his season with a grand total of ten points, and I don't think that reflects how good he is as a driver. No, James Collado is much better than his final points tally t- uh, total shows, and he's going to have a chance to prove that because he's going to be in a very high-quality AF Corsa Ferrari in the WEC. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's going to be very interesting scrap for a second. Uh, I mean, I think we've hinted at it on the server that realistically, the only things keeping DaCosta away from winning this is just not finishing the race or not being able to start the race due to a positive test, and we jokingly said that he's probably in the tightest bubble imaginable. <laughs> no, they locked him. No, they, they locked this man in a room with an old Game Boy and Tetris and told him, go break the high score record. <laughs> See y'all tomorrow. We'll we'll, yeah. we'll slide you some chips under the door to make sure you're, <laughs> you're fed. Go break, go break the high score record. And then when he's done that, do it again. Oh man! <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm hoping. Uh, I'm hoping Lauderer can keep uh, can rack up some more podiums to finish out the year. I'm already satisfied as a Porsche fan. I wanted two podiums for the year. I got two podiums for the year. Unfortunately, they all came from one driver. But <laughs> okay, I was kind of. I don't understand how Neil can be a god amongst mortals in LMP ones and be so bad in everything else. Well, I mean, I don't think it's, like, I don't think it's uh, everything else problem. I think it's specifically a Formula E problem. No, but even then, like, he wasn't great in GT1s. He was, okay, he was pretty good in A1GP, throwing it way back. But when you put him in an LMP1, I mean, he had the Le Mans lap record in 2015. And that was with traffic. Oh, yeah was on his way to a Le Mans win in 2017 when a big end bearing in the number one's engine decided uh, decided to clock out early. Yeah, also, a bit, bit of F1-related breaking news right now. 
Ferrari have stated their intention to appeal against this morning's stewards' decision regarding Racing Point. I'm sorry, but how can Ferrari protest the Racing Point design when the SF1000 cannot be considered design? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think we're going to take this chat to the server, but if you like the stream, yeah. uh, please subscribe to the channel, leave a like, and uh, support us on Patreon, and listen to the normal episodes of the podcast, which are pretty much just exactly like this. Not gonna lie, it is, this is exactly what we're gonna get on the normal podcast. It's like this, but with even messier intros and outros. Oh man, oh man. You only have about 252 episodes to catch up on. Well, well, you don't need to start from episode one. Don't do that to yourself. (laughs) (laughs) It was a a school project that got way out of hand. Oh man. But yes, the next night of Temple Off Nights will be night three on Monday, where we'll be joined by uh, friendly neighborhood Andre Harrison and uh, Stuart Garlic from uh, Emotion. So that that should be that should be interesting. Ooh. Uh, probably have a new champion by then. Probably have a new champion by then. More than likely. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but um, yep. Yeah. Uh, if you want to follow our personal handles, they are on the screen now. Yep, they're on the screen. Don't, don't even need to mention it anymore. Uh, yep. It was a fun show. Thanks for everyone for showing up. Uh, bye. Yeah. See you guys. Yep. See you all next time. Okay. Straight.